It's the most wonderful time of the year. As in, Big Finish releases Paul McGann Doctor Who audio adventures towards the end of the year. Hell yeah. We've got here the latest in the Eighth Doctor Adventures range, the Eighth Doctor Adventures Audacity, named after this new companion, Audacity, played by Jay Griffiths. Jay Griffiths plays Jack in the Doctor Who unit Big Finish Audio Adventures, but is now playing Lady Audacity Montague for the Eighth Doctor Adventures. So let's set the scene. The Eighth Doctor lands in 19th century London, and we've got Prince George, who is currently on the throne, and Lady Audacity Montague is trying to enact some parliamentary reform by convincing the prince in order to have better rights for, for women and the oppressed and the downtrodden and such. However, she is denied, which means that she tries to rob people at gunpoint. She's a bit of a badass. She's a bit of a Robin Hood type robber baron. Because of her lot in life, because of her status, she is in a privileged background, but she is still living under patriarchy in the 19th century. She decides to wish upon a star, quite literally. However, what happens when the star talks back? And it turns out that she has been making contact with a race in the stars called... The Devouring. This is a story, The Devouring, by Lisa McMullen, which introduces Lady Audacity Montague to the Eighth Doctor. The Eighth Doctor arrives in early 19th century London to try and track down The Devouring and also save Lady Audacity Montague from the fate that is now predestined for her. Let's play a clip from The Devouring. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm just looking for something. I do mind you, as a matter of fact. I mind you very much indeed. He just swaggered in and started turning the place upside down. I've got a trifle, won't never be the same again. You're a swagger? Do I swagger? A little bit, my lord. He's not your lord. I very much doubt he's a lord of anywhere. Time, actually. I'm a lord of time. Don't be ridiculous. You said you were a doctor. No, I said I was the doctor. Oh, he thinks a lot of himself, don't he? Mind you, he has got that swagger. I do... I'm looking for a telescope. In the kitchen? I've checked all the other rooms. What's that badger doing? Dolly, fetch the watchman down here. Tell him this man is an intruder. Somebody's been staring at the stars. And? Did you make a wish? What of it? Did nobody ever tell you to be careful what you wish for? There are some stars you really shouldn't wish upon. How do you... What do you know of the stars? More than you could ever begin to fathom. Now, where in the name of George III do you keep the telescope? In the observatory, Doctor. Where else? The observatory, yes. I probably should have started there. As you can probably tell from the cover and the costume, this is meant to be a relatively early days Eighth Doctor, played by Paul McGann, as usual, here doing an incredible job. The You may uh, recognise the outfit and the colour scheme. It is from a Doctor Who comic adventure story called Children of the Revolution, so I'm sure that you folks maybe appreciated the reference. I'm not an Eighth Doctor scholar, unfortunately. I think they call them the McGannophiles, but I'm not entirely sure. However, what we've got is that we've got a almost sort of like fairy tale like story it feels like a 19th century version of the 11th hour it's a really strong companion introduction where you do have audacity montague who is this sort of like badass but limited because of the time period in which she lives and was born and raised and etc she does have however a really lovely and endearing relationship with her husband ignatius montague played by joseph milson who is uh, very very lovely and very very supportive but is clearly punching way above his weight when it comes to audacity this is a really solid companion story introduction the devouring i will say solid as opposed to exceptional because i think that the the setting is really unique and novel but the villain the titular devouring is pretty generic it is just a case of like a bunch of audio filters and a really intimidating voice we're going to devour you nom 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 you know stuff like that it's a pretty generic threat you obviously don't want to open with something super existential i'm not asking for this story the devouring to be akin to say bloody zagreus 
or midnight or turn left or whatever there's a reason why companion or doctor introductory stories do have to sort of limit themselves in the in the scope and the ambition and how abstract and interesting they can be because the main priority here is to introduce audacity and i think that in this case it works really well the priorities are straight as uh, wonder productions points out it works completely as a strong introduction to audacity jay griffiths is absolutely amazing across both stories in this box set the devouring is a a fun historical romp through King George's England. It had a really cool inventive timey-wimey solution and I think that there's a lovely bittersweet ending into how Audacity winds up joining the Doctor along with his travels which I won't quite spoil but I thought it was really earnest, very sensitively portrayed and a very strong introduction. But the box set really does heat up with The Great Cyber War by Tim Foley. This is a two-parter. Both episodes are an hour long, so you've got a nice beefy two-part story here by Tim Foley, who has just been on absolute fire this year. So, Audacity's first adventure in the TARDIS takes her to Aurum, which is a space station literally made of gold, which is orbiting the planet Voga. And once the Doctor realises where they are, oh dear, he knows where he is. He has landed in the tail end of the Great Cyber War. You can see on the cover here we are dealing with Revenge of the Cybermen style Cybermen. We also have a Vogan here as well. These are voiced by Nicholas Briggs doing an incredible impression and very very faithful of the cybermen from revenge of the cybermen i.e they're a little bit bad but very earnest and what's interesting about the great cyber war both parts is that it starts to upend the canon of the cyber wars and the cybermen generally in really interesting ways in order to justify hey why is the cyber leader oddly emotional in revenge of the cybermen why does gold make sense as a weakness to the cybermen and how long has that been a long-standing thing for them it's really really interesting However, what we've got is that on this space station, Aurum, made of gold, the elites live here in complete protection, in complete isolation, because it's a gold spaceship. Of course, it's impenetrable to cyber attack because they are weak to gold. It clogs up their chest units and suffocates them. And they're building the Glitter Gun, which is going to be the final weapon in the cyber war, which will win humanity. However, it comes at a cost, the Glitter Gun in terms of the human slaves that are used to mine the gold and mine the materials and everything for the development of the glitter gun. We've got Gauta, who is the head of security on this space station, and she tries and fails to interrogate the Doctor. Let's play a clip from The Great Cyber War. I can tell from your posture you were part of the Earth Interstellar fleet, and your leg injury is old, but I'm guessing it never had time to heal properly. Fixed in the field? You've seen service, at least. Probably the winter system. I know they fought for decades there, and the tip of your index finger on your left hand was lost to frostbite. How am I doing? Very clever, Doctor. And now you're a station administrator for a group of people who, forgive me, must be a world away from your former comrades. You think the elite are the enemy? I like to believe that everyone is a friend until they demonstrate otherwise. Your wealthier guests are they putting their money towards resettlement shelters, refugee vessels, war zone hospitals? That last one is something that could have helped you, Gelter. How our visitors utilize their resources is none of your concern. I think it is when there is a war on. When everyone needs to be on high alert because this strangely decadent space station is key to your victory, surely. And the Cybermen will be on their way. What do you mean, on their way? Well, aren't they? This is the Great Cyber War. Humans versus Cybermen, you must be a target. The Cybermen don't even know we exist. I will say, with that music drop, that audio cue, the sound design of this box set was done by Benji Clifford, and this is genuinely some of his best work. The motifs, the, of course this is Howard Carter's music, but the implementation of the music and the sound design, Benji Clifford did an incredible job here. Did the Simon give McGann a back massage like they did to Tom Baker? No, they don't, but it does seem to be weaponizing some of the camp and ironic fun of Revenge of the Cybermen. Now, The Great Cyber War is dealing with an awful lot in terms of themes and in terms of plot. This is a dense 
two-part story. You've also got Oberon Fix, played by Keith Drinkle, who is almost assassinated at the beginning of the story. And it turns out that he is the engineer, the scientist behind inventions such as the Glitter Gun. He has got a, a bit of a self-important streak to him. And this even extends to him having a solid gold Cyberman statue in his operating quarters. And to be fair to him, he's got good reason to have such a high opinion of himself because he is frequently visited by time-traveling tourists. So he knows that the Glitter Gun is going to be the end of the Cyber Wars and he has all of this sort of, like, inadvertent precognition stuff because of the amount of tourists who have come to visit him. For example, I'm sure that in World War II, for example, a bunch of time-traveling tourists could visit Winston Churchill and be like, oh, you win the war you obviously he doesn't literally win the war this is a metaphor etc etc but they you win the war so that means churchill's like oh i i win the war like, what what does that do to a person and that's such a fascinating idea and also when you've got a character like audacity who sees the uh the miners who are being exploited and the slave labor in order to get the resources of Voga to win the cyber war and then all of a sudden wait a minute maybe the cybermen aren't the bad ones in this situation and then the doctor has to sort of step in and be like okay that's bad that's very bad and we are going to try and help him but the cybermen are so much worse aka it's modern political discourse this is bad but oh my god, don't vote for the alternative because we will lose everything. Really interesting themes here. And of course, some great humour thrown in because Paul McGann is absolutely hysterical and funny. Let's play another clip from the Great Cyber War. Let's hear from some Cybermen this time. Report. We shall arrive at the Aurum in 23 minutes. Why the delay? We must navigate the systems carefully. There are glitter mines that remain active. Proceed with caution. But we shall meet no other resistance. Leader, our ship attacking Voga reports a shuttlecraft escaping. Why do they delay its destruction? It is broadcasting a message on a cyber frequency. How is that possible? Relaying now. The Doctor. He is known to us. The Doctor is a Time Lord and a devious individual. Cancel the assault on Voga. Our ship in orbit must pursue the Doctor. I want that man destroyed. Nicholas Briggs does a great job with those accurate Cyberman voices, trying to ape the performance originally done in the 1970s. It's it's meant to be a deliberate nod to Christopher Robbie's portrayal of the Cyber Leader. That very thoughtfully and respectfully done. Now, like I said, The Great Cyber Wars is a dense story. I actually think there's a bit too much going on, particularly in part two. Part one this is a two-parter written by Tim Foley. Part one does a great job at setting all the characters up and the great uh, like interpersonal relationships and everything. Part two, though, is absolutely breakneck. It does not stop for its hour-long duration. And I actually think that the ending winds up being a little bit too muddled for its own good because there are so many like dangling threads. But it's only like that because there is so much interesting stuff going on. For example, like I mentioned, like you heard in the first clip there, you've got Gold to play by Trudy Goodwin, who gets in part two this like full blown monologue explaining one of her excursions in the cyber war, and it's an incredible performance. The cast here just uniformly are absolutely terrific, but that monologue just knocked me off my feet. The whole cast are great, but because there are so many cast members, because there are so many plot threads, it does get a little bit. Uh, it gets a bit intense, and not in like an emotional sense, but in a, wait a second, we're here now, we're going back and forth on the spaceship, and oh, now the Cybermen are climbing on the walls, and now the Cyber Leaders are trying to confront the doc. There's a lot. This may require multiple listens, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it may be one of those stories where, one minute, let me just re-listen to that scene, just to make sure that I'm actually following it. That's a bit of a death knell for the pacing. Now, maybe it's just my small brain. Maybe it's just my low IQ. It has been known to happen. 
I still really, really like the story, but this is one of those episodes, this two-parter, where you drop everything and listen to it. So don't listen to it while driving. Don't listen to it while washing the dishes or something. Either way, Audacity is a really, really good box set. I'll actually be quite surprised if this does not wind up in my top 10 come year's end. It would depend on what wild stuff Big Finish could release in December. It's got a really lovely ending as well that leads into the next box set from the 8th Doctor Adventures, which is coming next month in the bleak midwinter, which stars Paul McGann and Jay Griffiths again as the 8th Doctor and Audacity. This is looking to be quite a festive box set, which I'm really looking forward to. We've got three stories there, three hour long stories that are going to be festively themed. It ends on a really nice note. I wish that epilogue had a bit more time to breathe leading into it. But still, this is a very good jumping on point for 8th Doctor fans. Because you don't really need that much prerequisite here. For example, the 8th Doctor has encountered the Cybermen before. Very early on, it was like the Sword of Orion. I think it was like one of the first ever 8th Doctor audio dramas. It's a really good jumping on point. With a Doctor who has lots of really good jumping on points. Like What Lies Inside or Connections or the Lucy Miller series one. There's a lot of great 8th Doctor stuff, particularly over the past year, uh, Cass wasn't a big fan of. But still, over the past 12 months, there has been some incredible 8th Doctor adventures, and this is just another one to put on the pile. I think that Audacity is a really great and unique companion. I can't wait to hear more from her. I also think that pairing her up against the Cybermen was a really inspired choice, particularly when it comes to her allegiances to the proletariat. Maybe the Cybermen can help. Oh, wait, they're actually worse than the bourgeois. So, yeah, it's it's a really good box set. Really strong stories. But word of warning, the Great Cyber War is very dense. Make sure you have your head screwed on for that one.